Crimea is certainly one of the more contentious territorial disputes in the world we live in. The 2014 annexation by the Russian Federation not only resulted in sanction regimes being imposed on Russia, but also helped trigger a proxy war between Russia and Ukraine, which persists to this day. On a wider scale, the annexation fundamentally called into question a geopolitical order that's been in place since 1945, one which holds the territorial integrity and recognized borders of sovereign states as a core principle. So why would the Russian Federation potentially risk so much for the sake of a peninsula in the Black Sea? I'm your host David, and this week we are going to give you the Cold War era background on Crimea and how a 1954 decision continues to impact today's headlines. This is The Cold War. So to begin with, we should outline some general history of Crimea. This is largely necessary as one of the main justifications for the 2014 annexation was Crimea being a historic and indivisible part of the Russian world. Over the centuries, the Crimean Peninsula has been inhabited and controlled by various polities, including Scythians, the Roman Empire, Goths, Huns, Bulgars, and Hazars. By the 10th century, it was under the control of Kievan Rus until the Mongol conquest. From then until the late 18th century, Crimea was largely dominated by the Crimean Tatar Khanate and the Ottoman Empire. 1793 saw the Russian Empire win control of Crimea away from the Ottomans, and the peninsula remained under the control of the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union until the collapse of the USSR in 1991, at which point it was recognized as a territorial part of an independent Ukraine. But the contention, as I've alluded to, comes from a 1954 decision which transferred administrative control of the peninsula from the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So let's get into it then. By late 1920, Crimea was firmly under the control of the Bolsheviks and became an oblast, a province, of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. If you look at a map, this isn't the most logical decision, however, as physically there are no land borders to Russia, but rather to Ukraine. So the reasoning behind the decision was more strategic in nature, largely concerning the naval base at Sevastopol. Only a year later, Crimea was given a new status that of an autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. This was part of Moscow's program of Kordonizatsiya, or nativization, which aimed at promoting socialism and the Soviet order in Muslim communities. Crimea, with its large Crimean Tatar population, was the perfect choice for this program. The 1930s, however, were difficult for the Tatar population. Between famine and persecution, up to 150,000 Crimean Tatars were killed or forced to leave. And then in 1944, on the orders of Joseph Stalin, accusing them of collaborating with the fascist enemy, all remaining Crimean Tatars were deported and sent into exile in the east. Approximately 240,000 people were forced from their homes, exiled in perpetuity in what is known as the Surgun. With that done, after the end of the war, the autonomous republic status was abolished and Crimea once again became an oblast of the RSFSR. As a bit of context here, territory transfers between republics were not altogether uncommon. 1924 saw both Taganrog and Shakhty Okrug transferred from Ukraine to Russia. But the transfer of Crimea from Russia to Ukraine, when it happened, was not something that was expected. There had been no discussion regarding the matter, so along with that was no expectation. The 25th of January 1954 saw the Communist Party of the Soviet Union authorized the transfer of Crimea to Ukraine. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union followed this with a decree issued on the 19th of February transferring the Crimean Oblast to Ukraine. Pravda issued the following on its front page on the 27th of February. Decree of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet transferring Crimea province from the Russian Republic to the Ukraine Republic, taking into account the integral character of the economy, the territorial proximity and the close economic ties between Crimea province and the Ukraine Republic, and approving the joint presentation of the Presidium of the Russian Republic Supreme Soviet and the Presidium of the Ukraine Republic Supreme Soviet on the transfer of Crimea province from the Russian Republic to the Ukraine Republic. 
Okay, so we know now that it happened, but why did it happen? What was the decision-making process behind this surprising move? So a 2009 article published in Pravda stated that, quote, Khrushchev gave Crimea away in only 15 minutes. The article describes how Nikita nonchalantly told other communist leaders while on the way to lunch that he had decided to transfer Crimea to Ukraine. According to the article, the rest of the leadership would not dare to oppose Khrushchev due to his position and status. That 2009 article puts forward the argument that the entire discussion regarding the transfer took 15 minutes and that all members of the Central Committee accepted Khrushchev's proposal without any opposition. This narrative fits well with the reputation that our dear Corn Lord was to create for himself as leader of the Soviet Union one marked by what is known as voluntarism. In this context, that's when someone leads by making decisions themselves, by either ignoring the input of others in leadership, or by simply making a decision with no consultation at all. What's important to understand about Soviet leadership in the post-Stalin era is that it was at its heart a consultative process. There was a leader, who could be considered a first among equals, with the Presidium, later the Politburo, being those equals. Any decision that needed to be made was done in closed conversation with participants able to voice their opinions. It also meant that decision making tended to be by consensus, with behind the scenes compromises being a necessary factor. Once a decision was reached, it was agreed by unanimous consent. Khrushchev was well known for making independent decisions, for good and for bad, a trait that eventually cost him the top job. So the Pravda article paints a picture that's consistent with Nikita's reputation. But, and there's always a but, if we dig a bit further, we can cast doubt on this. First of all, consider that at the start of 1954, Khrushchev was not the undisputed leader of the Soviet Union. He was still sharing power at that time, and wouldn't really consolidate his power until 1956 and the secret speech. Second of all, Khrushchev wasn't the chairman at the meeting in which the Crimea decision was made, Georgi Malenkov was, and would certainly have had the power to veto any decision that he didn't buy into. Third, while Khrushchev had been the leader of the Ukrainian SSSR and understood that the rebuilding of Crimea after the devastation of the war would be easier if it was physically connected to its administrative parent, so did Lazar Kaganovich, presidium member and former leader of the Ukrainian SSSR himself. And fourth, Kliment Voroshilov, also a member of the Presidium, was on written record as supporting the transfer of Crimea to Ukraine, referencing the 1654 Treaty of Periaslov, which had unified Ukraine and Russia. From all of this, we can largely conclude that the decision was a collective one and not independently made by Khrushchev. Now, I can hear some of you yelling already, if it wasn't the capriciousness of Nikita, then what was the reason? Well, there's no definite scholarly conclusion, but there are several theories, as well as some myths. Let's take a look. One theory postulates that Crimea was given to Ukraine by Khrushchev as a gift. This is based on the idea that he had a soft spot for the Republic, having been the first secretary of the Communist Party there for years, and he wanted to give them a gift as a sign of gratitude for their loyalty to the Soviet Union and to Russia, citing the Treaty of Periaslov. There's also speculation in this that it was an attempt to make amends for the horrors of the genocide of the Holodomor in the 1930s. Now, despite the endorsement of this theory by the current government of the Russian Federation, who cite this as a unilateral injustice, the theory isn't necessarily conclusive. As we outlined before, Khrushchev was not in complete control of Soviet leadership when the transfer happened, and would not have been able to make unanimously that type of decision. It's also confounded by a lack of any referencing to the Treaty of Periaslov, only having been referenced in a speech by Voroshilov. So what are the supporting claims for Khrushchev's fondness for Ukraine, enough to grant them a new province? Well, he did have a deep relationship with the region. His second wife, Nina Petrovna, was Ukrainian, and Nikita had worked in the mines of the Donbass and risen through the ranks of the Communist Party there. On a broader political level, it's been suggested by Nina Lvovna Khrushcheva, a professor of international affairs and the great-granddaughter of Nikita, 
that her grandfather was looking to decrease the centralization of the Soviet Union, something which the transfer would have furthered, giving more power to one of the republics. Are you convinced? No? Well, a second theory focuses on the economics of the land transfer. The logic behind this theory lays in the official justification for the transfer, namely the integral character of the economy, the territorial proximity, and the close economic ties between Crimea province and the Ukraine Republic. It argues that since Crimea had been one of the most devastated regions of the Soviet Union during the war, Moscow was simply looking to transfer the burden of reconstruction from Russian shoulders to Ukrainian shoulders. As you might well imagine, this is a popular theory with many Ukrainians, as it posits Crimea not as a gift, but as an economic burden. Seems logical, but let's dig into it a little bit, as this justification, despite being the official one, is somewhat oversimplified. In the first place, the war had been over for almost nine years when the transfer took place, and as such, a significant amount of the reconstruction had already taken place. Let's also consider that the Ukrainian state budget was significantly subsidized by Moscow. Although the subsidies in 1950 were only 0.6% of the republic's budget, by 1955 it had risen to 13.4%. No doubt, a large part of that was being directed towards reconstruction in Crimea. Based on those numbers, it's far less obvious that Crimea was a sudden economic burden on Ukraine, so much as a continued burden on Moscow's bottom line. This is probably also a good time to point out that the Crimean and Ukrainian economies were not as linked as one might expect, given the only physical geographic connection to the peninsula had was to Ukraine. And the reason for that was that Crimea's major source of economic income was from tourism, as the near subtropical weather made the perfect region for resorts which welcomed visitors from across the Soviet Union. So certainly some doubt is cast on the economics theory. Now, a third theory focuses on the construction of the North Crimean Canal. Now, the Crimea had always had challenges when it came to the supply of fresh water for both drinking and irrigation. In an attempt to alleviate this, Stalin had made the decision in 1950 to build a canal from the Dnieper River in Ukraine to the Kerch region of the Crimean Peninsula, what was to become known as the North Crimean Canal. But like any major building project, it faced some substantial logistical and organizational hurdles, which would have hampered the speed at which the project could be completed. For example, each central ministry had an equivalent ministry at the republic level, which would be responsible to execute the centrally made decision. So the construction of a canal that began in Ukraine but ended in Russia needed the coordination of various ministries from two republics, each with likely somewhat different agendas. Regarding the transfer of Crimea to Ukraine, some speculate that this was done in order to avoid the inevitable delays and frustration that would have come along with a multi-republic project. But from a long-term practical sense, how likely is the transfer of an entire province from one region to another just to avoid bureaucratic headaches on one project? The fourth theory we're going to look at is one that gained a lot of popularity after the collapse of the Soviet Union. According to some, the territory transfer was done in order to add a territory that had a majority of ethnic Russians living in it to use as a base of support in the event of a crisis. It postulates that the Soviet central government intentionally supported ethnic minorities in each of the Soviet republics in order to use them as a threat to the ethnic majority in each of those republics. By dividing and conquering, Moscow tried to maintain control over the peripheries. Now, as I said, this was a popular theory in the days and years after the collapse, and seemed evidenced by ethno-territorial disputes which Moscow involved themselves in and included areas like Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan, Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia, and Transnistria in Moldova. There does seem to be some merit to this theory, but there is certainly more than one instance where the Soviet government decided to deport ethnic minorities from areas of the republics in order to create mono-ethnic areas. Crimea is actually one example of just that, as mentioned earlier. So where does that leave us? Well, it unfortunately leaves us with no solid conclusion based on the evidence at hand. In all likelihood, there was no one single reason, but rather a blend of all of these things 
each playing a role to some degree in the decision to transfer control of the peninsula from Russia to Ukraine. Of course, in 1954, it would have hardly been envisioned that the Soviet Union would collapse, leaving Crimea as a province of one nation, but claimed by another who would then arrange to actually take it back on the grounds of historical precedent. Regardless of the reasons and the history, debate and contention remains over the region with no clear resolution in sight. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have staked your claim to the bell button based on historical pretext. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at the Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. And don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it gets heated. <laughs>